Good morning. This is the beginning of the second year of our conference hosted by the Restoration Department of Vilnius Academy of Arts. My name is Indri Ujotaiti. I am an art historian working in the field of cultural heritage. I welcome you all to the third session, which is focused on the conservation and restoration of the historical interiors and their elements. It's a great opportunity to get a glimpse into the research and study cases of conservation students and their mentors from uh, four different European countries, Slovenia, Croatia, Estonia, and Lithuania. We are going to hear four presentations. And the, first, uh, the first two is focused on the uh, elements of sacral buildings, and the other two are based on the research of secular buildings, such as residential houses and catering establishments. Before we begin, I have uh, uh, to make a short announcement. If you have any questions, please leave them on the table or tablet on the right side on your screen, indicated to which speaker your question is addressed. They will, they will be answered at the end of the session during the discussion part of our conference. Now I want to welcome our first speaker, Eva Maria Fraz, a master's student from Academy of Fine Arts in Ljubljana, Slovenia. Her presentation is dedicated to the restoration and conservation of a mural painting in medieval church. Her mentors in this research is two conservators, restorers, Aida Mladenovic, I hope I pronounced it correctly, uh, who is also an art historian, and, uh, and Blas Schema, an assistant professor, professor who is also a painter. Eva Maria, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, my name is Eva Maria Fras. I am a student at the Academy of Fine Arts in Ljubljana in the Department of Conservation and Restoration of Wool Paintings. I would like to talk to you about some problematics which we face during the work process, a project that is being carried out for my master's thesis. Since May 2020, I have been working on a wall painting in the Church of St. Leonard in a small village near Ljubljana called Mala Ligoina. The church is located on a smaller hill above the village and is dated in 15th century and it was first mentioned in the year 1526. In Baroque, the choir on the western side was added as well as two pilasters on northern and two on southern wall that support the newly added vaulted ceiling which replaced the old supposedly wooden coffered ceiling. All these transformations in Baroque, including the window on Northern Wall, you can see on the right image, caused a great loss of the original painting. There were also some changes in the Presbyterium and the triumphal arch wall was supposedly added later also. So my main focus is on the Northern Wall, which comprises of approximately 20 square meters that's six meters width and four meters in height, minus the parts that were covered by pilasters, no ceiling and the choir in Baroque. The work began by removing all the secondary coatings with a smaller hammer, chisel and a scalpel. There were approximately 20 layers of whitewash and leveling mortars, which were mostly falling off in layers in smaller patches. There were some areas of the first secondary lime wash that fell off before the application of the second one. So on some areas, the second okra whitewash was applied directly on the paint layer. It bonded really well with the painting. You can see that in the middle in the upper area. It was not typical lime wash. It was not coming off in flakes or patches. It was rather dusty, somewhat more like clayish feeling to it. It had smaller to medium harder okra parts like crystals, but mostly it was just okra dust with quite weak cohesive and very strong adhesive bonds. Removing by scalpel was not ideal because the surface is not completely flat, it varies and it has smaller dents and peaks, which could get damaged too much, so we would lose some painted areas. At this point, I would like to mention that by visual examination, we could tell the painting was executed in seco style, plus it turned out the paint layer is soluble in water. It is possible that they used lime water or milk as a binder, but it weakened by time and humidity, 
and the pigment particles are now loose and easier to remove. As you can see, the ochre was mostly on the parts with figures and draperies, so it was really important that I remove it without damaging the original painting. Uh, here you can have a closer look at the problematic area. I tried removing the ochre by soaking it with cotton swabs with water, but it would just melt and become almost like muddy, and I could smear it, and it just became very messy and even harder to remove. So then I tried removing the ochre by applying water gel thickened with agar to control the penetration of the solvent better. But the ochre layer was very dry and dusty and soaked in all the water and it dried out the gel. The same happened with the tanul thickened with clotil G, so that method was also refuted. We tested consolidation through the secondary layer with different consolidants, nano restore, nano calc, and ammonium carbonate in pulp. The result was consolidated ochre layer and slightly consolidated paint layer, so it was actually harder to remove the ochre. Though the paint layer was more stable, this method wasn't ideal. So to remove the water-soluble layer from another water-soluble layer was a really big problem. So then I just took the scalpel and carefully started to scratch it and leveling it out as much as I could until I could see the painting underneath. So I just thinned it out to the critical thickness, then tried to erase the remains with Bishop sponge, but it wasn't enough. And that's when my mentors proposed to me this glass fiber eraser that is originally used for cleaning machine circuits, but the use has expanded to other professions and purposes also. It is basically like a brush with a lot of hard glass fibers and you use it like an eraser. So I used that and the results were quite promising. I could remove the dusty remains without damaging the paint surface. Although I had to be very careful and work slowly to control the pressure of the strokes. Uh, here is a close-up picture showing very little or no damage to the original painting. This method was used on all the areas on the wall and it took a lot of time. You have to use safety glasses and gloves and protective mask because there are very small glassy parts flying in the air which you should not breathe. As I said, it works like an eraser, so you wear it out and have to replace the fibers. Um, now I would like to do a quick review on the consolidation of the paint layer. For the purpose of choosing compatible consolidant, we took samples of all the pigments as well as the plaster. Examination of the samples was made by FTIR, Raman and XRF, which revealed that there was found calcium carbonate in every sample, hematite in the red pigment, which tells us that red earth was used, for the green was used green earth, the blue was azurite, which we know it has copper in it, for white was used just lime wash. We performed extraction of the binder, which resulted in calcium carbonate. We also examined the part of the intonaco, the plaster on which the paint layer was applied to, which we treated with the Lizarin S dye that colors only materials with calcium. So as you can see on the picture on the right, taken with microscope, all that is red is calcium, and the parts that are still white and gray are dolomite. So we have the dolomite substrate, which is rich in magnesium, and the blue pigment with a lot of copper in it. These were the main guidelines in choosing a compatible consolidant in this case. So considering all the required properties of a consolidant, we eliminated aqueous solution of calcium hydroxide for its low solubility, even at high concentrations, is not suitable for consolidation. Plus, we would have intake of large amounts of water, which could be destructive for the painting. We also eliminated the barium hydroxide nanoparticles because it interacts with magnesium and highly soluble salts of magnesium sulfate are formed, which ends in yellowing or darkening of the surface. Then we have also strontium hydroxide nanoparticles, which are usually used for historic stone surfaces where the substrate is contaminated with sulfates 
and cannot be cleaned by the Ferroni method. Also, the surface resistance to weathering increases. So in this case, because this was not the problem, we discarded this consolidant. We also eliminated ammonium oxalate, which is typically used for consolidation of outer statues and paintings that are exposed to acidic weather conditions. Plus, the ammonia formed during the carbonate substrate reaction can change some pigments, in this case, azurite. Then we have diammonium phosphate, which is very compatible, but the problem with it is that the newly formed crystalline phase does not fill the pores. It is limited to the pores, pore surface, so it doesn't penetrate deep enough. Uh, the ammonia carbonate is problematic because of the ammonia that could react with some pigments, for instance, malachite, which is chemically very similar to azurite, and it could have some unwanted, unwanted reactions. So the only consolidants that we should consider here are alcoholic dispersions of calcium hydroxide nanoparticles, which are used to solidify historic porous carbonate materials. Commercially known products are Calosil and NanoRestore. Both are basically nanolime with different particle sizes. Calosil is an alcoholic dispersion of calcium in propanol or ethanol in various concentrations. It is used on lime surfaces like mortar, plaster, stone, wall paintings, marble. It is more suitable for consolidation of intonaco. Because of smaller parts, it penetrates deeper and it was used in the lower parts of the wall where the plaster is broken and roughly cracked. You can see that on the left image. On all other parts of the wall, we used Nano Restore in isopropanol in concentration one to one. We applied it by brush through Japanese paper in one coating. As I have tested the stability of the paint layer before and after consolidation, you can tell that there is a difference, but I may have to repeat the procedure one more time just to be on the safe side. Uh, at this point, I have to mention the necessity of measuring of the pH of the surface before and after the consolidation, which should be in alkaline range. As the work was progressing, we engaged the research on the author of the painting. I would like to focus on these two parts of the painting, which are best preserved and carry some important information about the author. As I was removing the secondary coatings, we could see some figures. Among them is a king. You can also see fragments of a horse in the central area. To make it easier to picture the scene, I emphasized the incisions that were made during the transfer of the scene on the wall in fresh plaster, which is a known feature in Gothic wall paintings. At this point, it was getting clear it is a scene of adoration of the Magi, a typical Gothic painting of the northern wall. On the left image, we have this central area where we can see a castle in the background and some hills. On the left, we have two flags which were being carried by the horsemen. On the right ending of this area, by the pilaster, we can see a part of a horse and four persons here nearby riding the horse or in the background. Uh, due to changes in humidity, unfortunately, a lot of the painting was lost, but we can confirm a king here. You can see the crown and his green royal brocades that give us important information about the author. The others are escort tribute bearers or musicians with some fragments uh, of their attributes. This goblet shape in the middle could be another treasure from the king. On the left by the pilaster, we can see some fragments of another horse and a person's waist and some fingers. On the right image, we can see red drapery with blue lining. Here we can confirm Mary holding baby Jesus at the central area where basically all the paint layer was lost. But by a very close look, I could draw a silhouette and some basic lines. Uh, so Jesus is sitting in Mary's lap. Her head was unfortunately lost in Baroque. Um, on the left, we have fragments of another king with, with his drapery at the bottom with red and okra. We can also distinguish this treasure chest 
by which the king is paying Jesus his homage that are gifts of gold, frankincense and mirth. The important feature of the painting are the brocades on the royal drapery. One part is black on green. I emphasize the shapes here so we can see it clearer. Another part of a brocade is found on the right below with red on green. Then we have the king by the Jesus uh, who has some fragments of red on okra. All, of the, all of these fragments are part of a bigger rapport which is known to be used by Master Wolfgang and Master Leonard at the end of the 15th and the, at the beginning of the 16th century. So based on that information, we narrow the artist to these two or their apprentices and workshops. As we know from the literature, Wolfgang was active around years 1455 to 1500s and had some apprentices, including Master Leonard, Master from Mace, and Master of St. Jacob in Ribno. So if we take a quick look at Master Wolfgang's style in Church of St. John the Baptist in Slovenia, we can compare the similarities on the face lines and we can tell that there is a bit different feel to it. Here in Mali, going on the faces feel sad and sentimental with compassion, while on the left, faces are more basic, soft, with no pale, with no harder contrast. On the left drapery, we can distinguish all the hard lines. The drapery is not yet falling very softly like on the right image. So we could say this painting on the left was a bit earlier. If I proceed to Master from Mace, uh, where we have a well-preserved painting of the Adoration of the Magi, we can see that the composition of Mary with Jesus and the Magi is very similar but the overall style is a bit different. For example, the castle and the hills in the background are much more precise in Mace. The castle is very detailed. And although there are many similarities, for instance, formation of the hair and the softness on, on the draperies, I would say this was not painted by the same hand. Uh, now we will compare some of Master Leonard's paintings. If we take a look at this figure with an instrument, uh, the basic shapes, the cheeks, the eyes and the hair are quite the same. Plus, if we compare the faces on the lower picture here, uh, we can see the lines around the eyes and the eyebrows are almost exactly the same. And these are quite specific and accurate details we have to consider. Some would say that the formation of faces specifically eyes and lips, are some sort of an author's signature. As well as the crown and the formation of this man's face, the details on the beard, the nose and the eyes are very much alike. Also, we have a very similar composition of Mary with baby Jesus and the Magi bowing before him. The softness of the draperies is much better constructed than from the previous authors we saw. The lines and the formation of the draperies, the softness of the transitions from the dark, darker to the lighter parts um, are very smooth. We can also see some similarities at the horse's head. Here we could almost say that the horse in Mala Ligoina is even more precise and constructed better. But unfortunately, the greater part of it was lost. So when comparing the horse, we have to rely on the incisions that remained in the wall. We should not forget to compare the border style, which makes this typical frame for individual scene. We can see this gray square stone mark that is basically the same, and by my opinion, a very important information. Plus this red line here was used on both paintings, which is an important feature to acknowledge. As you can see, the patterns are also very similar. The geometrical line is made of these figures and it is the same. The only setback, setback could be the lower floral pattern, which is different. But as we know, one master used different patterns and in different colors. So this should not be the reason for exclusion. By closer examination, I could see some differences in the intensity of the paint and that tells us the borders 
uh, were painted by using a stencil to an extent you can see on this graphic image on the right. As we know from the literature, artists often used copper plates as a template for the scene. In Gothic wall paintings in this region, they used mostly copper plates from Meister ES, and in earlier Gothic period, the graphic templates from Biblia Pauperum. Here is an example of the adoration of the Magi scene from Biblia Pauperum on the left image, and the copper plate number 27 from Meister ES, and we can see many similarities which could reveal this historic phase of making of the painting. For all the comparisons above, I have to mention that Master Leonard is known by his freedom of changing some elements in composition. He was not as strict with templates as other painters. From all the comparisons of the style and formation of the figures and draperies, my guess would be that the painting in Maya Ligoina was painted by Master Leonard or possibly by one of his apprentices. I have to highlight that these assumptions are my own and not necessarily 100% accurate, and that this matter will be consulted by art historians in the field. In the church, there is also a painting in Presbyterium that is, all, that is still covered by all the lime washes and will be a future project. By revealing the painting there, we will probably have a more assuring conclusion on the author. So that would be all from me. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eva Maria, for your very interesting presentation. For me personally, the most exciting part in this research is the authorship determination of the wall painting. So I can't wait for the discussion part. The second presentation in this session is from Croatia. I'm welcoming Andrea Shafram from Academy of Fine Arts in Zagreb. She has gained a master's degree in sculptural conservation. Her mentor for this research is Associate Professor Anna Bozicevic. Andrea will present the restoration and conservation of the pulpit uh, made from stucco, a unique example in Croatia's sacred heritage. Welcome, Andrea. The screen is yours. Hello, my name is Andrea Shafran. I come from Zagreb, and today I'm going to talk about the conservation and restoration of a pulpit um, from the Church of St. Stephen in Stefania and also the stucco technique and examples of um, marbleizing it. So my pre presentation and will cover art historical and science uh, research uh, that I did for the pulpit, uh, along with conservation and restoration procedures, as well as some theory about stucco technique and how it can be used to imitate marble. Uh, so the pulpit uh, is made of stucco, specifically the stucco lustro, um, technique or, or stucco lustra. Uh, it was painted while dry, so that's what it means, um, using oil paint uh, as well as uh, gilded with oil. Uh, the pulpit has also um, a wooden canopy, uh, which I won't talk about here. Um, so the church records state the dating to be of the 18th century, uh, and uh, the name of the author is actually known uh, to be Ludovicus uh, Zkavic but we don't know um, his original um, origin. Um, during my research, I actually found no examples of stucco pulpits in Croatia, which makes it a very valuable and a special piece of church architecture. Uh, so Stefanie is a small town in the northern part of Croatia. Um, the town Stefanie was built around the St. Uh, Stephen's church in the 12th century. Um, the first mention of the church is from the 13th century, uh, where it is described as to be a, a Gothic church built in the place of an old wooden church that has burned down. Uh, the church was significantly changed in the 17th and the 18th century uh, in the Baroque style, which is when the shape of um, that it uh, that it has today actually became from in a, in a cross shape. Uh, in 2006, with the program of the Protection of Cultural Her Heritage of the Croatian Ministry of Culture, 
uh, investigative works began on the entire church inventory. Um, the probes uh, that were made showed multi-layered uh, overpaint. Uh, with, within the same program, the complete wooden inventory was restored in the period from 2006 till 2018. Um, three altars were actually restored by my mentor. Uh, this is the main altar of the church, the altar of St. Stephen, the first martyr. Uh, here you can see the um, altars in the side chapels. Uh, by closer um, observation, uh, we actually noticed a signature of Ludovic Uskavich, the author of the pulpit, uh, on the altar piece and on the side of the altar uh, below the console. Uh, the church documents state that Ludovicus sculpted some of the pieces of the altar, as well as uh, pieces of some of the other side altars. Um, even though the wooden inventory is restored, uh, the church has significant moisture problems, which cause crumbling and blistering of the plaster, as well as, uh, as some um, salt efflor efflorescence. But uh, luckily, the structural renovation of the church has since begun. So more about some science research. Um, here's a graphic representation of the pulpit with marks of places where I took stamp, uh, samples of FTIR and XRF analysis on the left. And on the right, you can see the, the places I took microsection samples for stratigraphical analysis. So FTIR uh, or Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrography uh, is used by exposing the sample to IR rays and measuring the amount of uh, absorption of certain wave wavelengths, showing a specific curve for a specific matter, while XRF is used by exposing the sample with X-rays, where the constituent elements of the sample emit characteristic radiation, which is then collected and displayed by means of a de detector. So every peak that you see on the curve represents a single element. So we use these analysis um, to see what we have in the different layers. So here are some of the most common elements and compounds we found in each layer. So the stucco is of a common composition, uh, the combination of lime and gypsum. Uh, the polychromy is uh, done with oil paint and the gilding, depending on um, the actual layer is either real gold or in others a mix of mostly copper and zinc. So we he uh, here we see some microsection analysis uh, and they prove the existence of three polychrome layers uh, as well as a thin layer of varnish in between them. Uh, we can also see the fine granulation of the stucco. Um, deeper stucco analysis weren't made because of its destructive, destructive nature. So more about conservation and restoration. Uh, this is the pre-work condition in 2019. Here we can see the um, wooden canopy. So the way the pulpit was constructed is visible on the fence. On a closer look, we can see the lines between assembled pieces. This, along with the nature of fine stucco, uh, made me come to the conclusion that it was made in a workshop using several molds and then assembled in situ. Uh, we also noticed metal clips on the top of the fence for additional reinforcement. Uh, the only considerable damage that was visible on the pulpit was on the base of the pillar, uh, but thankfully the damage uh, is on the very uh, surface of the stucco, so there wasn't any real um, constructible, uh, con considerable structural damage. Other than that, occasional weakened and scaly polychromy was noticed on the evangelists, especially on the gowns that were originally gilded. Uh, to determine the actual preservation of the original paint layer, the probes uh, that were already there were expanded and the micro samples were taken for stratigraphic and natural science um, analysis. So the condition of discovered paint layers proved that uh, the overpaint was exclusively done um, in the purpose of fashion um, or to match the rest of the church's inventory. Here you can see um, some of the stratigraphical probes. 
So um, standard conservation procedures were made with some cleaning, consolidating and probing, which were then followed by restorative procedures. Um, as the original paint layer proved to be well preserved, uh, it was decided to remove the other layers, not only to show the original look of the pulpit, but also to present in accordance with uh, all the rest, the rest of the altars. Um, after removing the overpainting, uh, the support layer was filled with a gypsum base filler. Uh, the painting layer was reconstructed using acrylic paint and uh, the gilding layer with Schlagmetall powder. Uh, to remove the overpaint layers, we used a combination of mechanical and chemical methods. Uh, we used two kinds of uh, paint stripper and gel form. Uh, removing them with scalpels and the, re the residue was removed with acetone. As the final stage, we wiped everything with white spirit to stop the chemical reactions. Uh, here's the pulpit before and after overpaint removal. Uh, because there was not much use in documenting the complete um, middle paint layer, I presented the pulpit in three different stages graphically. So consolidation was performed at the base of the column, where all the stratigraphic layers were damaged due to capillary mo moisture. Uh, the consolidant uh, we used was a 10% solution of Paraloid B72 in acetone. And um, the original paint layer in that area was damaged to the greatest extent, which proved that uh, the capillary moisture created problems uh, earlier in the uh, in earlier periods as well. Uh, here you can see the areas where fillings needed to be made. Uh, the applied putty as well as the rest of the pulpit were isolated with 25% uh, Latopal A81 uh, varnish dissolved in shell sole A and shell sole D40. And here you can see some of the details of the pulpit before and after paint layer retouching. And here's the complete pulpit. And now I would like to speak more about the stucco technique. So, um, Stucco is basically made with lime, gypsum, cement, animal glue. These are the most common binders. And as aggregates, um, sand, gravel, uh, crushed stone, marble dust, crushed brick, chalk, fiber, all kinds of things were used in, um, in history. Uh, there are different manufacturing methods to make stucco. You can model it in situ. Um, it's mostly used for Rayleigh's or self-standing sculptures uh, in combination with um, other manufacturing techniques. Um, cast stucco is the way that the pulpit was most probably made. Uh, uses self -stand is used for self-standing sculptures or subsequently attached reliefs. There's also a method of squeeze stucco, which is used for uh, different materials. For example, um, um, paper gouache or something like that. Uh, you can use it for subsequently attached reliefs. So the way that cast stucco is made is using either a waste mold in which um, you put some of your um, mass into a, a mold and then you break it, or you can use a flexible mold to actually re uh, be able to reuse it. Um, so you can also use um, a mold that is closed with a little hole in it and then pour some stucco in it uh, or you can use a multi-part hard mold to reassemble um, the mold itself. Here are some different examples of stucco application as a relief sculpture and um, a pulpit. So to talk more about marbleizing um, stucco, there are different ways of doing it. You can paint it. Um, that method is actually called stucco lustro. Um, you can paint uh, the stucco either on the, um, as like a, a fresco uh, technique using um, paint on the fresh plaster or the seco technique on the dry 
um, plaster, or you can, of course, combine it with the fresco seco com um, combination. Here are some stucco luster examples. Now, the, the reason why painting stucco is so specific is you can also um, polish it to a very high gloss, making it really seem like uh, marble. Um, and the last um, technique with marbleizing stucco is actually plaster toning. So here is an example of gypsum mixed with animal glue and pigments, which you then uh, use in a form of dough and then combine the different colors um, into the either a mold or just using it as a cut pieces. And uh, after drying and polishing, it also makes a beautiful um, uh, marble effect. Here's an example on one of the um, altars here in Croatia. Now, these aren't uh, specifically related to uh, this altar, but it is a common color combination used on um, altars and things like that. Now, Skyola is actually um, a very a specific uh, method using um, stucco marble that we uh, talk about uh, just now. Um, it actually uses um, intarsion with that same technique, but um, the, the terms are um, usually mixed. Um, many, many, uh, many of the uh, sources um, are very um, contradictory when they uh, talk about scayola, stucco marble and stucco lustro, but um, I hope I made it a bit clearer for everyone. Uh, so here are some stucco, uh, scayola pattern examples that you can see uh, mainly on altars. So uh, in conclusion, <laughs> uh, I would say that um, the pulpit in, in the Stefania church uh, has really proved to be an, a unique example of stucco uh, in a freestanding object um, in Croatia. Um, I would say that professional conservation and restoration works have restored its artistic and aesthetic value and its original appearance, uh, but uh, historical and aesthetical integrity has been achieved uh, with its restoration. Um, further deterioration has been slowed and with it the pulpit is preserved for the generations to come. Um, about stucco technique, I would say it wasn't, it isn't very well researched or represented in literature, which is why I chose this to be the subject of my uh, master thesis. Um, and I realized that there is less and less well-equipped uh, trained masters of these techniques and I think effort should be made to preserve these valuable skills and art pieces. So um, I hope uh, we can achieve that together. Um, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrea, for your presentation. Uh, I kindly remind our audience that the question part will be at the end of the session. The third presentation uh, in this session is from Estonia. Uh, the speakers are Rina Pader, who has earned bachelor degree uh, from Palace University of Applied Science uh, in Tartu, and her mentor, a painter, conservator of war paintings, Professor Helle Tuxman. Together, they made a case study of two houses on Lay Street in Tartu. But today, uh, we are going to hear mostly about the older one, uh, built in the late 80th century. The main focus of this presentation uh, is the management of the learning process and various tasks for the conservation students with different preparation levels. Welcome, Heli and Rina. The screen is yours. Hello to everybody. I am Heli Tuxam and I am Rina Madar. And we will speak about the practical training in Palace University of Applied Science. Uh, the example is researching of historical wall painting in Lai Street, Tartu. The great challenge of teaching the conservation is to include the practical activities to the study arrangement. Nevertheless, it's, uh, the training is ex uh, ex the training experience from the real object 
are necessary and the most effective. And we are happy in Tartu that we have this kind of project in every year. Almost in this corona time, we had this kind of possibility. The case study from 2019, finishing research in the building located at Lye Street, one of the oldest districts in Tartu. And the investigation was necessary for the restoration project. Here on the photo, you can see uh, the Lai 34 house, which was built in 1886. And it, in the same time, it was connected to the Hasa house, which is Lai 36. And this history comes much farther. So, uh, in this presentation, we will uh, focus on the older house, Lie 36, and I will now give a short overview of its history. Uh, the first important date is 1775, uh, when there was a big fire in Tartu that uh, took down nearly two-thirds of uh, Tartu's mostly wooden houses. The legend says that the fire was started by a math teacher who was making beer in an outside uh, yard. The fire got out and was spread uh, very quickly by a strong wind. Uh, it is known from the archives that uh, before the fire, there was a one-story uh, house made of stone on that plot, and it belonged to the von Rennenkamps. On an after-fire city map, the building is marked as burnt down, but it is also stated that the owner is planning to restore the house. A new one-story house was built sometime between 1778 and 1786 and art historians think that the doors on the first floor with rococo-like leaf motifs are from that era. In 1803 the house was bought uh, by the family of von Knorrings who owned it for over 100 years. The second floor was built sometime between 1830 and 1846, but there are no architectural, architectural plans preserved. In 1886, when the Lai 34 is built, they also changed the facade of Lai 36, uh, including uh, moving the front door from the center to the left side. And they also connected the two houses through the second floor. In 1922, both houses were bought by the University of Tartu, who again owned them for almost 100 years. During that time, the houses were used by the Agricultural Department and later Painting Department. About two years ago, the houses were bought by a new private owner who now plans to restore them, and that's why the interior finishing investigation was done. To plan the study uh, work on the study time is always complicated. In this case, we had two houses with uh, 48 rooms and two months in the end of the year, which is always busy time. Based on the action plan, we calculated approximately 500 working hours plus the documentation and 200 openings. In reality, there was more than 350 openings. In autumn semester, we had uh, for restoration subjects nine credit points, but in the lessons time table, there had two days on week to carry this project and a small group of students, seven persons. Another big task was to cover all these topics in the respective subjects. And the subject in the autumn semester was the conservation of the wall painting, the investigation and documentation of finishing research and restoration project. We in Tartu work in combined groups it means that the third 
and fourth-year students are working together. And happily, it gives a possibility to third-year students to get their knowledge in the next academic year. The fourth year, I already get them before. About the decoration, one aim of the investigation is to understand the early interior decoration in connection to the history of the building. From our history, we know this building connected to the rich decoration in the hall of the second floor. The art historians are not yet in common position to interpret dating this decoration. We know that the second floor was built when the owner began one story. He rebuilt the house, adding the second floor. El Mucros and Epidophre, our art historians, compare the design style to the Louis XVI Rococo. There are wonderful frames with floral garlands and medallions, but the lower part decoration is more in the spirit of Robert Adam. The re relief is low and in the middle of a canvas ornament there is an antique urn. You can see it on the left picture. To the right picture you can see the opening where we can see uh, the first layer of polychromy. But all the later layers was mainly in light tonality, having a golden bird belts around the frame. On the right photo, you can see a leaf gold photo made under the microscope. Uh, the ceiling decoration, a clearer later addition, the historian and architect of the project, Ivar Rosa, dates the decoration of the second floor much later. Second floor offers some other interesting findings. In the dining room, there is a very nice wooden graining, and there is also Simple but effective stencil painting under the decorative wooden frames. Anyway, the ground floor, which belongs to the original building, turns out to be much more interesting and exciting. Uh, since we knew that the first floor is older, we decided to check under the first layer of plaster, and it was. Uh, very good and rewarding decision. We found wall paintings in many rooms, like beautiful acanthus motifs, Pompeii style frames, uh, drapery, leaf garlands, uh, stencils, and also some interesting uh, ceiling paintings, but uh, they are probably from a little bit later times. So every student got assigned with one room, and about that room, they had to write a description about all the important details like uh, layers of paintings on walls and ceiling, windows, doors, floors, and uh, fireplaces. Oops. Uh, everyone had to write down, determine original colors and photograph the exposure that they made and later make a color card report for the final documentation. So I got to sign the room on the first floor which you can see here on the pictures, uh, with a nice fireplace. Under the plaster, there were several layers of wall paintings, but the most beautiful one was the canvas in pink and white in the upper section of the wall and also above the door. The reconstruction of the canvas motif on the right here is made with computer not in real life. Uh, in the subject of historical interior, we also had to draw up uh, a room plan and try to imagine how the room uh, looked like during its glory days. 
And here you can see your work from a third year student. Since the houses were big, a lot of rooms to investigate and a lot of info to write down, we had to be super organized. Very precise directions had to be given to students uh, about how and what to write down and how it has to look like, so that after uh, when putting the documentation together, we wouldn't have too much to correct. For determining the original colors, we used the uh, Picurilla Symphony color cards, and uh, it's important to mention because uh, they have an online color sample page where one can search the right color by its code. So it was very easy to add those little color samples to the report cards. And now, conservation uh, conservators uh, mostly prefer the NCS color system, uh, which also as an online color sample page. For file sharing, we used Google Drive and organized files into folders there. Uh, some technical problems occurred with file formatting because some students used OpenOffice or LibreOffice, and some problems came with uh, exchanging files between Mac and Windows. So sometimes we had to use the PDF format, but um, then uh, how can you correct it or or add a card number or something like that? So for that, I used an online PDF to doc uh, converter. And later to put all the cards together, I used an online PDF merger. So we had to be quite uh, creative with those kinds of technical problems and how to solve them easily without uh, putting lots of work on ourselves. Since the houses are two separate architectural monuments in the Estonian heritage, heritage system, we had to write two separate reports. And because Lie 34 was uh, a bit smaller, we decided to get the documentation done on that first. And thanks to that, there were things to learn about how to solve some kind of technical issues. And uh, when putting the Lie 36 report together, which was bigger, it was a little bit easier for us. Uh, so, in conclusion, I would like to point out some numbers that are for two reports combined. The descriptions and results uh, together with photos took uh, 137 pages. We presented 264 photos, uh, also 223 color report cards, and in addition also some graphics. To the end, we were happy uh, that we were able to complete all this work on the toy. And also, uh, it was a very good experience. And maybe what is most important, that there was a lot of new findings of the period classicism from part two. Anyway, the building uh, the restoration project already began and the best findings will be exhibited. And there will be also possibility for our students to work on real objects. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I think it would be very interesting to compare the learning uh, management techniques uh, from different countries and universities. The final speaker in this session is Rugilia Brujaite from Vilnius Academy of Arts. She gained a master degree in uh, for interior restoration, uh, and this presentation is based uh, on uh, the thesis of her work. Um, the research is focused on the interval period catering interiors in former capital of Lithuania, Kaunas. Her mentor is restor uh, restoration architect and uh, immovable cultural heritage protection specialist Vidutė Pavilovskaitė. Welcome, Rugilė. Uh, hello, I'm Rugilė Brušėtė and introduce a master's degree thesis, Visibility Study of a Restoration of Kaunas Interior Cafes and Restaurant inter Interiors and project proposal for their revival. 
as uh, first world uh, world war near uh, near it uh, end, Ukraine act of independence was singing of the 18th February 1908. For where were geopolitical tensions and territorial conflicts led to the fact that already in January 1919, in the face of the Bolshevik attack, the government of the country was quickly transferred to the southern largest city of Lithuania, Konis. Konis has a Acquired a unique status, it has become a temporary capital of the Republic of Lithuania from 99 to 1939. It became an example of rapid urbanization and modernization and ex expressed the values and aspiration inherent in many sides of Central and um, Eastern Europe, Europe during the interwar, uh, encouraged by optimistic belief in the future of independence. The city was allowed to grow and the state free from the past authority created an, an identity that matched the ideals of a new state. Civil servants, politicians, diplomats from the other country and intellectuals moved into a new political center. The city became the most important center of the country and had to represent uh, the state. The changing role of, of the city in the state's life inspired by a gradual scale of construction and urban development. The territory of the city of Konas has grown seven times from 1990 to 1930. 4,149 um, 4, buildings were built uh, to com commemorate the unique of the office period, the nominated application file. The modern city of Konas architecture of optimism was submitted to the World Heritage Center of UNESCO. The concept used by interval contemporaries to describe the current innovation modernis modernistic synonyms, new, progressive, modern. The concept is not identical to the definition that modernists are uh, as a stage in the de development of the art. Short video about Konas between the wars and the view of freedom avenue. Much of the research subject is the interiors of Catherine establishment in Konas during the interwar period. Cafes and restaurants with the most available description of iconography and interior materials have been selected for case study. Geographical boundaries of the research during the interwar Catherine establishment we are operating all over cones. However, the main feature of the um, interior development and change a more expressive interior style were present in the use located in the central state of the city, Freedom Avenue, um, or Crossing Street. Uh, the research is con uh, conducted based on archival materials, periodical publication, and article replying interwar context, recent memories, and surviving photography. Iconographic and comparative study are performed which allow reconstruction of the interior image or, or of the selected objects, the interior of Catherine as punishment. During the interwar uh, period, cafes were primarily a meeting point to spend time. The stand prevailed uh, toward Europe at that time. The accreditation perfectly illustrated was in the, uh, in the nomination application for inclusion of Vienna cafe culture. In the list of in integral uh, cultural heritage, a cafe is a place where time and space are used, but only coffee is included in the recent. While in Europe, um, cafes were divided into Bohemia for singing cafes. A cafe in Kronos couldn't be a meeting place for both artists and bourgeoisie. It couldn't host orchestras, dance, performance, uh, rooms for playing billiard, poker, or chess. Thus, the cafe owner and manager had a great challenge uh, reconcile visitors' different needs uh, in one space. Uh, as the popula population grew and the institutions were created, the need for specific space uh, also increased. Reflecting um, and shaping the different architectural trends of 1930s and 1940s, 
In Kunas, the new city, capital infrastructure was created. The architect's intention focused on the innovation offered by modernism direction. This new construction, communication, and equipment technology increased general sanitary and hygiene standards also change. Two styles, direction and notably national style and moderns. Na the national st style was based on the historical of Grand Duke of Lithuania and folk art studies, which uh, had become the main feature of his style. Modernists inspired cafe interiors prefer natural material, minimal decoration, and constructive style. Um, the Piano Center's company was situated in the main street of Kona, Slices uh, uh, or Freedom Avenue. In 1934, Four, a representative administrative building was built, which was designed by architect Vito Taslansberg This building has become an expiry interwar modernist architecture work. This building attracted a jury and an international exhibition in Paris in 1937. It was accorded to an honorary diploma for an a bronze medal. Uh, progressive thinking and contemporaries related to Western culture. It is not coincidence that uh, Piano Central's Cafe were called American cafes. The fast food supply and modern cafe interior were linked to progress. Uh, we would find many similarities uh, by analyzing the restaurant Preston designed by Autobahn in Paris. Illuminating group. A uh, large stage glass window surrounding interior walls, wide buffets with metal details. These elements connect buildings in Kronos and Paris. Vitotas, uh, architect Vito Taslans Bergijamkalin started designing the diner from a small room in the corner in a, of the building in the architect's sketches. The main room was dedicated to the store needs. Uh, the store was equipped with, with high tables next to large showcase, and curved buffet was drawn along the perimeter of the walls, which connect to the partition separating the store from the dining. The auxiliary premises were modest, equipped with a table for servant and an elevator leading to the basement. Three round diameter tables were planted in the diner area, including chairs. In 1914 and uh, 1941, the um, 41 electric heater is mentioned in an inventory. Perhaps the heater was meant to expand the working hours of the outdoor equipment. There was no shortage of the, uh, such heaters in major European cities, enable outdoor. Um, all the culture of cafes was essential during the interwar. No authentic interior has survived to this day. Change in public and private ownership depend on economic consideration, and this, was, um, and this has always been an essential aspect of the survival of personal and cafe interiors. To encourage inheritance uh, in the master, master tests, it was proposed to revive interiors of the interwar based of historical, archival, date, and memories of contemporaries. The cafe was, uh, Piano you know, Central's cafe was on the first floor. Now, the, now, um, now uh, the uh, catalogue of the prem premises of the farms. Consi considering the current situation of the valuable properties of the premises, it is proposed to restore the former initial functional layout of the premises. Uh, a is in the room of the store dine in combina combination with the facade, the roof with, with, with metal elements and selected glass and around the top corner and white paint. The work tables with black edge, round sheet, and arrange. Next to them, turn at number eight chairs, reflect the type of a single chairs without proper specification. B is chosen to implement the rooms, fragment upon the architect sketches, separating the room from dinner by two meter glass block partition. Multifunctional rooms, um, C, uh, 
uh, uh, equipment uh, which can, uh, can be carried about, uh, out by arranged tables of conference organized using the same inventory. Uh, the B room is separate from C room by full height partitions and so uh, insulating the room. In context, uh, contrast, to be separate partition with the C and D rooms. Uh, and fitted with a sliding system, allow the rooms to be ex extend of the exposed part. Um, sorry. Um, the room, uh, um, oh, no. okay, D. Uh, the room uh, with a separate entrance in memorial of architect Vito Paslan's religion and goodness, and with that, uh, piano centrist building exhibition. The piano centrist diner was character characterized by refined modernist interior. Light color, colors, white and natural wood, color of black details. The catering establishment culture was able to claim the most modern interior of the catering established during the interwar in Kronos. Second, Officer Club Ramon. Kronos uh, has had the status of a foreign city since the Tsar Empire time, and the officer have always been an essential part of the so city social life. As military power grew between the wars, so did the authority of the officers. Like most Europe, Europe countries of the time, they, are, um, they were clubbing. In Lithuania, these clubs were called Ramones. In 1913, there was an idea to build a new building for the officer club, and a, a club and an international competition has launched for a design work. In the terms of the competition, one main criteria was the visualization of national ideals. The furnishing and fitting out of the premises had to be represent of the state. From the beginning of the concept development, uh, the design of the building was uh, intended to install a restaurant of the first floor. The restaurant found resembles uh, the T shape with the um, uh, and a launched volume and the hall to which the two office and auxiliary rooms uh, are connected from the slides the sides the elevator uh, shaft uh, ac across all floors allowed to the, provide food for the restaurant and other reception facilities as mentioned above the kitchen has the basement so then mm, uh, so the um, uh, so the connected between the kitchen and the restaurant was made using the local phone. This building was a uh, discussion by the it's, it, its unique ventilation setting and headed cleaning and quantified uh, five times per hour. The air supply system was installed in the basement that that that's installed in each room while the restaurant hall we we are in the lower part. Of the new niche. The restaurant to Ismajane was one of the few restaurants built in new building. Uh, decor decoration of the center part of the white ceiling was imitated by caissons. Square caissons were formed by plaster beams decorated with oak leaves and a corn pork. Present of the squares are the six lamps with opal glass covers and other equipment. They were illuminated with a light combina combination of different colors. All this was revival of calm, bright world on ground without observing um, the decorative ceiling work. At first sight, the revived simple decoration of the interior reflected the requirements of the ethnic, uh, uh, national style and modernist principles. The officer club Ramada was supposed to be represent the state. The special attention has paid to creating the national style interior. A uh, repeated um, uh, pattern of the windows decorated for forging metal, tulip motifs, and grills. Opal glass bra luminaires installed between the windows. According to, to the remaining furniture drawings, the tables were manufactured without broken or wavy shapes or, or uh, incrustation. Wood was used for furniture, wood uh, was polychromed with black paint. 
Uh, the building was equipped uh, uh, predominantly with local construction and finishing materials. Escape for the rich green latter in the restaurant hall used the chairs and armchairs, which came from inland. Um, restore concession. The proposed, uh, proposed project aims to restore uh, the authentic elements based on the historical material, reproduce the feed elements in the absences of date, and use the internet interpretation method. Select the situation uh, conscious uh, to install a to install separate wardrobe drop using mobile solution, uh, b uh, to restore the former office function, uh, c and d. The office uh, um, is equipped with a serving room with the out, outer portal door. The E, um, the, the former office premises adapted to the administrative, administrative function. Uh, and at the fee three, instead of current kitchen, a bar is installed on, uh, enclosed in the whole screen server. To carry uh, uh, out detailed polychrome and floor covering test in the restaurant hall, floor covering was selected in the project by imitating the bracket in the main hall. The current um, special layout and removed by disciplining mobile furniture constructed following, following the avail available drawings. Conservation and restoration of the whole lighting, a former stage is restore construction as an open area between the hall of uh, and hall and the bar. Um, preservation restoration of the windows, reproduction of ex exciting reels covering the windows according to available samples, uh, modern and the national style where organic combination com combined in the restaurant interiors, uh, three smilgeny, which was established in the end of the interval period. Due to the emphasis of the representative function, uh, the quality of the materials and furniture was paramount. After, establish, uh, after establishing the uh, officer, officer house in the building in Soviet times, uh, the life of the building remained unchanging. There are some premises, uh, uh, one of the few space of the signature of the half preserving their original purpose. So we are still authentic details to this day. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rugile, for your lovely presentation. Now we are going to have a small discussion, and it is your last chance to send us your questions. So I want to welcome back our speakers. Uh, it's so nice to see you all on one screen. Yeah. Um, we have many questions, so we have a lot of work to do. So let's start the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, one minute, please. Uh, first of all, we we're going to ask Eva Maria, um, and uh, the question is from Oshirina, and she uh, she's asking. Uh, uh, first of all, the compliments from our audience, uh, Oshirina as well, and uh, uh, the question is. Um, did you uh, find uh, any research concerning possible damages of the fiberglass uh, abrasion to the uh, below layer? I think it's uh, um, it's about uh, your work with scalpel. Uh, yeah, so um, I didn't actually find any specific research of this matter uh, because this brush is not... Um, used as often as it could be, I think. Um, but I think it's uh, important that everyone who, who uses it should test 
uh, the critical thickness and um, um, so I think you should push it to the point where, where you do a little damage so you know when where to stop. So it's it's actually a uh, it depends on on each case. So you can uh, see from your work when from your practice. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. You should just, pr just try it, and you'll see uh, when you do the damage and, and put a step back. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Eva Maria. Uh, you have also two related questions about uh, using uh, gels. Uh, so first yeah. of all, how common in Slovenia restorers using gels uh, for uh, cleaning the wall, uh, wall paintings? And maybe the second one, um, do you uh, have opportunity to consider uh, the, uh, the, that gels leave uh, restitutes and their impact on the surface? Mm. Um, so I cannot speak for all the Slovenian restorers, but as far as I know it, uh, the gels are usually used after all the mechanical methods are, are already tested and couldn't do the work. Um, so because the chemicals can always do some damage to the painting, we should first try every mechanical method we can think of. Uh, but in some cases, that is the only method that does some difference. Um, and of course, we have to do smaller uh, tests before using the method on bigger areas. Uh, um, so for the residues of the gels, um, in my case, I used very rigid gels. So agar, it's very thick and, um, and it, it just stays on. It doesn't leave any parts. Uh, plus, usually the, the thickeners are not, um, are not dangerous to the painting. And usually you can, you can uh, remove all of it. Uh, especially because you have to use as rigid as possible for the surface. Just, yeah. Thank you for your answers. Um, also, very technical question. Uh, did you need to apply a removal or, of soluble salts procedure? Uh, what uh, practice applies to you? Uh, so on most parts on my wall painting, um, there was no crystalline phase on the surface of the paint layer. So the use of chemicals for removal of soluble salts was not necessary. Only in lower areas on the wall where um, I found some smaller fragments, which I didn't show you because there was not enough time to work around that problematic. Um, those areas were exposed to greater changes in humidity there I could identify salts. Uh, and some tests for removal will be made. For now, I have tested uh, cationic resins, uh, which were not aggressive enough because the, the salt uh, residues were quite thick. Um, but the project is still going and was paused in the winter because of the cold conditions in the church. So I will test some more chemicals for, for that probably. So usually we, we test um, Try ammonium citrate and EDTA. So that's um, uh, you're probably familiar with it. Um, so all, maybe I should mention that um, on some parts I have uh, salt residues so thick it probably won't be able to remove it chemically. So I will I will try it um, by the vibrating pointy diamond needle. That's also one of one of options. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I want to remind uh, to our speakers that you can interrupt uh, and to uh, say your opinion if you just want to. So welcome. Um, so two more questions for you, uh, Eva Maria. Um, Dale is asking you um, how often uh, do students uh, can work with uh, medieval paintings in Slovenia by restorating them? Yeah, I would say definitely not often enough. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, we're usually not, um, uh, let's say, <laughs> Uh, they usually don't trust us with with this size of or this um, problematics 
that much. Um, students usually do more of a research or simulation for how sh something should be done, or we take a smaller piece of the heritage to examine and work on. Um, <clears throat> I would just say I was very enthusiastic and I prefer practical work and I like wholesome projects, not just a face in the procedure, uh, because I believe that's the only way to understand the complexity of the restoration that we have to consider and we have to be careful about all the steps in the work process, not just focus on one. Um, I wish we, we could work on, on, on bigger projects all, but it, usually it's we're not able to sadly <laughs> hmm. and understandable yes uh, yeah. and uh, the last question not not the last question but uh, now the um, from me um in your uh, biography, you mentioned that uh, a few years ago you switched uh, from the conservation and restoration of sacral wooden uh, heritage to mural paintings. So my question uh, to you would be how the experience in your previous field uh, affected your late studies? Do you find any similarities between them? Yes, definitely. Um, that's why that's why I like uh, I like <laughs> mixing fields. Um, even though some resorts would say that you cannot focus on all the same, um, but I think it's important to to have knowledge about all of it because there are many procedures um, and methods um, and materials that are used on on all different uh, heritage pieces. So um, yeah, I was working on on wooden uh, wooden uh, golden altars of the fifth, uh, 17th century. Um, I also work on um, on oil paintings on canvas. Um, it is good to know um, as many procedures as possible and and mix it and and try and figure out. Uh, combinations which would what would work there and also here uh, it's it's very interesting and I think it's important that we have uh, as broad as knowledge as possible thank you for your um, answer so uh, me uh, I think we, we will have a few questions for you at, at the end and now we are um, want to ask uh, uh, Andrea and uh, also to welcome her, uh, her um, teacher, Anna Bozicevic. Uh, welcome. It's so nice that you joined us. So maybe you both can answer these questions. So uh, the questions from Milda. Um, does moisture in the church affect the stucco pilaster? Or, uh, and also does the moisture problems were solved in the church? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, I can answer this, perhaps. Uh, well, uh, the moisture affected the lower zones of the column, uh, where the paint was completely destroyed, as well as, uh, as the carrier, and the upper zones were in a much better condition. Uh, as uh, for the humidity in the church, uh, unfortunately, um, it was not the, exactly the right order of works it should, uh, as it should be because the drainage uh, workouts and uh, renovation works uh, are just uh, now uh, underway. Uh, so um, we, uh, the, the works on the pulpit uh, were um, made before uh, the, re the restoration of the whole church, if you understand me. <laughs> yes, thank you. Maybe Andrea? Well, you can join to other answers. Oh. Uh, Andrea from Nature. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I so nice to see you. Right now, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the green screen. Yes. Yes. So the second question is from Della. Um, she's also uh, thanking for the presentation. Many compliments. Uh, which is uh, which historical stucco technique are more popular in Croatia? Um, so I would say that uh, we have we have about twenty or so um, stucco marble, so stucco marble um, examples on altars that we see in churches. Uh, a bit, a little bit of uh, stucco as a decoration in interiors, but um, 
also stuck who can be um, seen on most uh, historical like 18th and uh, 19th century buildings in Croatia um, because uh, all of the facades have really nice stucco decoration so um, it can also be um, considered to be stucco so I would say most of it is on on uh, facades Yes. Uh, so we also have uh, a question about uh, maybe art history. Uh, Andrea uh, Ruta is asking, uh, maybe you know the storyline of the figures of the pulpit. Uh, what scenes uh, are depicted there? I think that you uh, tried, or maybe not you, answered uh, like anonymous uh, in our section, but I just uh, ask you to to... Um, repeat or to tell in more details. Okay, so uh, on pulpits, it's very common to see the four evangelists, and that's what we actually can see on the pulpit. We have the four evangelists uh, and also their um, attributes, the, the animals that uh, represent them. Uh, also, they're holding uh, the, um, what, uh, the books, like uh, the thing that they wrote, the evangelical. Um, and uh, on also on one field we only, we only have a flower because there's five different uh, fields on the pulpit but only there, there are only four evangelists because of the shape of the pulpit uh, one whole space needed to be filled so they, um, the author just put a flower on it yeah thank you uh, we have two questions from Oshirina. Uh, first of all, she she really hopes that she can rewatch it. Yes, uh, I think we all just found very uh, impressive your presentation. Uh, and she asks, uh, does the conservation of technique uh, you summarize principally required similar conservation approach? Yeah, and uh, maybe the second. Uh, uh, question from Oshirine is: uh, Do you not do you notice the decrease of the overpaint uh, removal practice in Croatia? Uh, well, actually, overpainting removal is um, only considered uh, to be um, ethical if there's a good enough reason to do to remove it. Um, because, uh, well, we we decided to remove it not only because. Um, it was very well preserved mm -hmm. uh, and uh, no, not much damage. We, we didn't, we couldn't do much damage to it because it was in a very good condition, all, all three paint layers. Uh, but because we wanted to uh, show the, the original uh, look of the pulpit as well uh, as it was uh, presented in, uh, in the 18th century because um, also the, the altars of the church were restored and presented uh, to be to look like um, they did in the 18th century. So right now we have a complete um, interior of the church uh, that matches well together. Um, sorry, can you repeat the first question? I didn't really understand it. Uh, yes, uh, the uh, the first question. Okay, sorry. I lost my face, but if you can hear uh, I me, think so... it, I, I think it was about uh, the common practice uh, about the te technology in Croatia. Uh, I would say that, uh, uh, of course, it, it depends from case to case, but in this case, uh, we can say that uh, some common practice was followed. Yes, that, that's how we do here. <laughs> So thank you. You can see me, but uh, I'm here from the dark talking to you. Uh, yes. Um, uh, next question would be: How long did did it take to uh, for you to complete this project, and have you been working alone uh, with it? Uh, I had some help on the project. Uh, at some point, um, the four of us actually uh, did the overpaint removal and then the retouching um, it was me and another colleague uh, the whole process took me about a year or I think maybe even more yeah a bit more 
uh, but because we had um, we had to pause in between for a couple of months, we uh, we had I had to, some research and writing to do, so I couldn't travel from my hometown to to Stefania. Um, also, um, the academic year was actually uh, um, at, at that time, so I had to go to um, different classes uh, as well as uh, COVID, <laughs> which was. Uh, uh, actually prevented uh, us from traveling from Zagreb to there. So yeah, the the work itself uh, lasted about three months, I would say, something like that, three or four months. Mm. Yes, maybe a little more. Yeah, the problem is about the field work always because uh, we didn't have uh, accommodation over there, so we had to travel every day. So it's uh, quite, um, it's not very easy <laughs> if you have to tra travel about the kilometers uh, in a one way every day and you have to work all day and then you have to go back just to sleep over and then um, go back and so if, if it's uh, in a continuously uh, for a few months it can be a very very exhausting yeah it affects uh, all of us I think in very negative ways so um, and uh, um, I myself uh, also have a question for you too. Uh, so, um, a few years ago in Vilnius Academy of Arts, we had a visiting Scagliola master from Italy. Uh, he led the workshops uh, for academy students and shared the principles of this historic technique. So, I want to ask you uh, about the Scagliola situation in Croatia. Are there professionals mastering this craft, or do you have to learn, uh, learn this uh, technique uh, from the masters abroad, like we did? Uh, well, I only know two of them, but there's a few more, I, I would say. It's not a very popular technique, um, it's not very known, and uh, when it is restored, uh, it's not always restored in, uh, in the same technique that it should be. It's usually um, either filled with just plain stucco and then painted. But um, it's not a very complicated technique. I had some, um, I had some uh, help from professors and uh, those, uh, the, a couple of masters that uh, know it. But I also learned it um, when I was uh, abroad in, in Krakow, in Poland. Uh, when I took um, the Erasmus um, Plus scholarship. So uh, I spent six months there and learned a bit more about that technique there. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And we have uh, one more question for you, Andrea. Uh, so uh, Erika is asking, are you working with uh, sculptures made from G uh, gypsum? Uh, do I work with gypsum sculptures? Well, uh, yes. I have stored some before, yeah. Uh, but um, I'm actually interested in all kinds of materials. Right now I'm working on uh, a wall painting uh, conservation. So um, I think it's all a bit similar in organic, uh, in organic uh, materials. I'll have some same, same um, uh, conditions that uh, and and the procedures that uh, they undergo during restoration, and uh, the the material is susceptible to similar kinds of damages. So um, yeah, I actually enjoy working on all kinds of uh, materials. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Erica is our student who works with gypsum, so uh, maybe that's why she's asking, and maybe uh, we can share your contacts if she has any um, other um, questions. So uh, thank you for uh, Anna and Andrea, and now we are uh, moving to uh, our other speakers. Um, Rina and Helle, hello, nice to see you here. So, uh, we have a few questions for you. Um, so, uh, Milde is asking you, is the architecture uh, paint research uh, curriculum subject is quite a new practice in uh, the academy? Uh, in our academy, we have it already from the very beginning because it's very important if we work in uh, the historical uh, uh, objects and rooms, uh, so the documentation 
as a subject is uh, going, yes, from the very beginning uh, when we are teaching the restoration also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, also uh, a question from Ilda. Do you write polychromy research methodology yourself or it is based on the official government documents? It, uh, we have uh, we based to the um, government documentation because uh, uh, the report goes to the heritage um, abroad to be uh, given the permission that it's well done or not. So, uh, so we follow all these rules. Hmm. Thank you. And Dela is asking, did the restoration students uh, has done art historian research in Ley Street House as well? Uh, is that, uh, is that, uh, or did uh, other researchers? So uh, I think the question is about, uh, 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 does the professionals do the research or you let the students uh, uh, do themselves we mainly uh, students uh, do them mm. it's a it's a good learning practice of course yeah so uh, uh Oshirin is asking you do you face a problem of the decorative ceiling block uh, uh, detaching was the support of the wooden grain gypsum in this case, there wasn't a gypsum used. It's a two-dimensional painting. It's uh, it's mainly oak graving there, and uh, uh, yes, it's two-dimensional. Just there was uh, so we uh, just now will start with the restoration project, and I hope that there will be uh, one. Uh, uh, Diploma work project for this room, actually. Yes. Uh, so, also uh, uh, the question from Professor Haley Tuxman What type of wooden it was imitated in the dining room? Uh, was there any gilding used? In this case, in dining rooms, there wasn't gilding. It's, uh, yeah. It's just painted uh, uh, decoration and wood craving. But it was all over the walls and, and ceilings also. Yeah, thank you for your uh, answer. Uh, and I also uh, want to ask you, uh, Haley, uh, in the abstract of, of your presentation, the historic wallpaper was mentioned, how it is preserved in Estonia in general, whether it is so stored in museums or preserved in situ? Uh, there is uh, different possibilities. Some of them are preserved in situ, but uh, we do not have yet uh, the museum. And uh, actually in our school, there is quite big uh, a collection of historical wo uh, wallpapers. And we try to the contact of the, the uh, learning and teaching process to restore uh, these findings and and to find a possibility how to preserve well, how to, um, to 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 keep uh, them uh, in good quality yes oh thank you very much very interesting i'm interested in all um, papers mm. so it's very really ni nice to hear that you have many examples maybe we yeah, uh, will visit you <laughs> yeah, someday. Please come and look. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, I think that we have some questions. Just please don't leave us. Uh, we will have some uh, maybe uh, questions for all of you. But now uh, I'm, I want to ask some questions, Rugile. Yes. And uh, uh, Rugile was the last one uh, who spoke, so uh, my question is a little bit uh, messier. So uh, I just beg for your forgiveness. And uh, first of all, uh, first of all, I want to ask you about 
Elias. Uh, how many uh, interval cafe interiors reconstruction projects have been implemented in Lithuania? Rugile, we can hear you. Please unmute yourself. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, as far as I know, no interior of, uh, of the interwork affair was uh, reconstructed in Lithuania. Several interiors of Soviet uh, time affair have been restored. Uh, example, Nerega. Thank you. Uh, also for you, your master thesis was defended two years ago. Did you work receive any feedback from Kona's municipality or building owners? Very uh, concrete question, yes. <laughs> any feedback uh, or question from municipality or owner I don't have. Uh, and yeah, so uh, it, Milda had a similar question. Uh, does your uh, concept of restoration of Kona's Cafe are going uh, to be realized soon in the future? So I think that you already answered that uh, you are still waiting. Yeah, I really yes. Hope. I really hope so. <laughs> yeah, we, we too, we too uh, hope so. And uh, what's more? Uh, yes, uh, question for you. Uh, if you have to choose only one cafe to restore, which uh, it would be? Uh, interesting question. If I have to choose, uh, it would be this machine. Um, as we are surviving mostly authentic uh, details, and the buildings uh, still belong to Yes. So, uh, I also have a question for you, uh, and my question is about hard things. So, what is the hardest task to uh, of preparing the restoration project of historical interiors uh, with public function, like in your case? Um, one of the main challenges uh, is to adapt in the space to current sanitary hygiene standards, uh, fire protection, and life safety systems. And uh, new society needs um, uh, sound system, TV, and other things, and that all the, these changes uh, do not affect the uh, in historical interior. Yes, thank you, Rugile, very much. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> so, so you can see me uh, again, and I have a few. Um, question that I want to ask you all of you so uh, uh, the first one, the first one is similar uh, like uh, to Rukile, so maybe she she can relax a little bit and uh, my question is what are the greatest challenges that you have to overcome uh, in restoration historic interiors or their elements so who can be first Eva Maria can you think about something? Hmm. <clears throat> Let's see. <clears throat> uh, well, <clears throat> maybe in this case that I'm working on right now, there is a, a big challenge about the aesthetical presentation of the whole painting, because as you could see, the the most of the lower parts were lost. <clears throat> so it's a big question about the reconstruction of the painting. Um, where we have to consider the, all the ethnical um, problematics. So if we, if I would uh, retouch the painting and reconstruct it, would that be my work or would it be, uh, you know, my personal contribution and the value of the painting was lost because of that? Um, <clears throat> or maybe for the <clears throat> Excuse me for the um, aesthetical uh, value of the interior of the church. It should be reconstructed. Maybe that is um, quite a big dilemma, <clears throat> but um, I think I already figured that one out because <laughs> uh, it would be too much of uh, of my work in it. So 
um, I don't think I'll reconstruct it. Um, maybe more the ethnical dilemmas about uh, changing the 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 whole look of the painting. <clears throat> it is a complicated matter. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I think that uh, or, uh, every restorator uh, face this dilemma and uh, when you face it early on and you think about this ethical di dilemmas, I think it's uh, a great way uh, to grow. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, Rina could tell us about her challenges. Um, mm. What can I say? <laughs> uh, during this project, I think the main issue was to uh, find the time to to go to the object and uh, do the work there. Because uh, as Hedy mentioned in the beginning of our presentation, uh, we had only like uh, two or three months to do that. And at the same time, we had uh, uh, lessons uh, in school and so on. So we had to find actually some extra time uh, to go there and afterwards of course the documentation uh, and putting it all together uh, took a lot of time too. Yes, thank you. Uh, and maybe uh, Yeli and Anna can uh, talk about uh, the uh, challenges that you see in your students, they have to overcome. Hele, Anna? Uh, well, I think that the biggest challenge is to uh, to learn uh, students uh, how to establish the right technology uh, while they're working. Uh, the, that the technology that will not damage the art, uh, but uh, yet uh, that it will give some uh, good results. Uh, I think that we have to learn our students uh, uh, how to be very careful uh, with dealing with uh, works of art and uh, that uh, they, even if that sometimes it looks they don't have enough time, that they should uh, stop and say, okay, uh, I will do some uh, more uh, um, researches uh, just to find the right technology uh, how to work on this piece. I think that th this is the most important part of uh, our education. Thank you. Heli? Maybe what I can say is uh, how to combine all these uh, theoretical and practical knowledges uh, because uh, yeah, the, the practical training is good but also you also time have to uh, to read and to know more about this uh, theoretical and all these possibilities you have and uh, you have uh, to have this um, background knowledge from which you can choose the methodology or but uh, what I like to say about this uh, object or the challenge is also um, in, in the case of investigation that uh, how, how much you could open the surface at all because uh, there is a big responsibility what happened with openings after when there will be uh, the renovation works and uh, there is a, a big danger uh, situation that uh, they will, um, will disappear after all. So uh, to, uh, to understand all these uh, drawings and all this uh, um, decoration system and in the same time not to touch too much. Maybe this was in this case also um, a challenge what we, we were faced with. Thank you. I think that uh, some uh, it's uh, Similar, like uh, Eva Maria talked about the intervention of this when you are a student. So uh, we have uh, no questions. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you uh, to our speakers for sharing their ideas and uh, discoveries today. It's so um, 
it's so inspiring to see talented and curious students and the amazing uh, mentors <laughs> so thank you to our audience uh, for participating in the discussion for your questions and uh, this session is over and now we are going to lunch break and meeting again at 2 p.m lithuanian time and after lunch we are having our final session dedicated to the restoration of architecture architecture. The session will be moderated by my colleague, art historian, PhD candidate, uh, Marius Damaskevicius. So, see you soon. Okay, thank you very much for uh, organizing this conference. I just wanted to say it's very important uh, to share this knowledge. And we hope that we will meet uh, even uh, out of this conference someday, maybe. <laughs> thank you for good organization. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.